Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about sickle cell disease. So what is sickle cell disease? Well, it is a group of hereditary blood disorders with characteristic sickle-shaped red blood cells. So you can see here, the cell on the right is a sickle-shaped red blood cell, and the one on the left is a normal red blood cell. Now, sickle cell disease is inherited, and is actually inherited in incomplete autosomal dominant fashion. So on the right here in the schematic, you can see that an individual, an affected individual, has two copies. They're homozygous, so they have two copies of the affected allele. So they're considered affected. So, um, and individuals with only one allele are considered unaffected carriers. So it's, it appears to be recessive condition, but in fact, even individuals with one of the affected alleles can be, can be affected to a very slight degree. So that's why we considered incomplete autosomal dominant. So as I mentioned again, an individual with two copies of hemoglobin S, S um, just standing for the sickle cell disease allele, so hemoglobin SS or homozygous, these are the affected, these are the individuals that are fully affected by sickle cell disease. And um, these homozygous individuals make up about one, um, one in 400 to one in 600 African Americans have or are homozygous for sickle cell disease. And the other um, portion of individuals, the individuals with only one affected allele are considered heterozygous and they are considered to have sickle traits. So again, they're very slightly affected but not as much to the degree as someone that has um, homozygous uh, hemoglobin SS. And Individuals with the sickle trait or heterozygous individuals, about 7 to 8% of African Americans have sickle trait. Now, the sickle cell mutation appears to be protective against malaria, so that's the reason why it seems to be pro, uh, are persistent in some of the populations where malaria is pre prevalent. So individuals with one allele seems to be the best um, way to be able to pr be protected against malaria. So what is some of the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease? Well, it all has to do with the hemoglobin beta globin chain. So the beta globin chain of hemoglobin is affected. And this beta globin chain is encoded uh, on chromosome 11. And in sickle cell disease, it's actually all due to an amino acid substitution at position six on the beta globin chain. And all it is is a substitution from glutamic acid to valine. So there is only a single point mutation changing glutamic acid to valine at position six on the globe, uh, beta globin chain. And this is what causes the um, deformed red blood cell uh, shape, the problems in um, sickle cell disease are all just due to a single point mutation. And what happens is um, when this beta globin chain is mutated, we consider it hemoglobin S, and deoxygenated hemoglobin S is less soluble than deoxygenated hemoglobin A, the normal hemoglobin. So that means that whenever hemoglobin is deoxygenated for some reason, it can lead to increased polymerization. So that means that hemoglobin S can start to aggregate and accumulate together. It leads to RBC sickling. So deoxygenated hemoglobin S can lead to RBC sickling. And the RBC sickling occurs during conditions of stress. And when red blood cells do undergo sickling, they can lead to hemolysis and they can lead to occlusion of the vasculature in these individuals. And you can think about it, if the red blood cells are traveling through different um, vasculature like capillaries for instance, if the cells are misshapen in particular in a sickle shell shape, they may get clogged and they may get stuck in certain areas in the vasculature. This is what leads to a lot of this occlusion and a lot of symptoms related to sickle cell disease. And this is something we call microvascular trapping. And all of this leads to hemophagocytosis. So 
a lot of times we'll get white blood cells coming in and they will be essentially cleaning up a lot of these red blood cells, a lot of these sickled red blood cells. And this leads to a dramatically reduced lifespan of sickled red blood cells. And in fact, it's about 17 days. So on average, a normal red blood cell lives for about 120 days, but a sickled red blood cell can live from anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 days, usually about 17 days. So again, it's because these red blood cells become sickled, they get clogged in certain areas, specific, uh, especially in microvascular areas. This can lead to an inflammatory reaction. White blood cells can come in and start to phagocytize these uh, red blood cells. And that's why you see a dramatically reduced uh, lifespan of sickled red blood cells. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of sickle cell disease? Well, some of the acute complications of sickle cell disease are that individuals with sickle cell disease are at an increased risk of infections. Furthermore, because of the sickling of red blood cells, these patients can experience severe anemia. And again, it's because of the sickling of the red blood cells. And again, sickling of the red blood cells occurs during conditions of stress. So what are some of those conditions of stress? Well, they can include fever, they can include infection, they can include dehydration, hypoxia, and acidosis. So anything that leads to a deoxygenation or further deoxygenation of hemoglobin S can lead to sickling of the red blood cells, which can lead to complications. So again, these individuals are at an increased risk of infections. And in fact, infections can lead to sickling. So it's a vicious cycle of sickling and symptoms of the red blood cell sickling. When the red blood cells do undergo a sickling, they can lead to vasal occlusion. And a lot of symptoms of sickle cell disease are due to vasal occlusion. Some of them include acute vasoocclusive pain. So when a lot of these sickled red blood cells get, get essentially trapped or occluded within the vasculature, it can cause pain. It can lead to stroke in some patients. There can be acute chest syndrome. There can be renal infarction, myocardial infarction, preopism, and venous thromboembolism. So anything that can lead to clogging up of vasculature can lead to formation of thrombi, um, emboli, emboli can lead to infarction, so pr essentially cutting off the blood supply to certain areas like the kidneys and the heart, can all be due to red blood cells being sickled and essentially clogging up those arteries or clogging up those vascular areas. So what are some of the chronic complications of sickle cell disease? Well, essentially the biggest complication is uh, chronic compensated hemolytic anemia. So chronic compensated, chronic, it's a long-term process compensated. The body attempts to compensate because of the chronicity of the anemia and hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic essentially means the body is destroying the red blood cells. And this leads to these individuals essentially having chronically low levels of hemoglobin. And essentially it's, a, it's usually these patients can have hemoglobin levels from anywhere from 60 to 90 grams per liter. The hematocrit is usually low as well. It's about 20 to 30 percent. These patients, when you look at a blood smear, the cells can have, um, or the cells can be polychromastic or have polychromasia. So when you look at them, they can be different colors. So on a blood smear, you can see here's um, some normal cells and you can see these other cells that are different colors. So that's essentially what polychromasia means. These individuals can have reticulocytosis. It's about three to 15% of blood cells can be reticulocytes. Reticulocytes are just immature red blood cells. So what happens is when the body is destroying um, through um, that hemophagocytotic process, you're destroying those sickled red blood cells, the body compensates. It starts to try to produce more red blood cells and releases more immature red blood cells. That's why we see increased levels of reticulocytes. And another thing you can see in a blood smear is something called Howell Jolly bodies. And Howell Jolly bodies are these basophilic nuclear remnants 
uh, inside a red blood cell. So you can see those as well when you look at a blood smear. And other chronic complications include pain, usually from vaso occlusion. There can be neurologic deficits in some patients, pulmonary conditions due to an increased risk of infections. There can be renal hypertension, osteoporosis, cardiomyopathy due to diastolic dysfunction, hepatotoxicity, delayed puberty, reduced growth, chronic leg ulcers, and proliferative retinopathy. So not all of these can occur in um, every patient, but some patients can have some of these other complications. Some of them are due to the vaso-occlusive properties of sickled red blood cells, so pain, um, again, due to vaso-occlusion. Um, because of pain, individuals may not be as active as other individuals, so they can have decreased bone mineral density, leading to an increased risk of osteoporosis. There can be, um, again, chronic lag ulcers due to some of these, these vaso-occlusive properties as well. So how do you diagnose sickle cell disease? Well, there's prenatal tests to determine if a fetus carries sickle cell alleles. There are newborn screenings to do the same thing to see if a newborn infant is carrying a um, mutated allele for sickle cell disease. High performance liquid chromatography can be performed to assess and also hemoglobin electrophoresis can be used to diagnose sickle cell disease and usually it's either with a cellulose acetate or citrate agar gel and if you see more than 30% hemoglobin S in these patients then you can say okay these patients most likely have sickle cell disease. So once we diagnose sickle cell disease how do we treat it? Well one of the mainstay treatments of sickle cell disease is hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea can reduce episodes of acute pain it can reduce hospitalization rates and can prolong survival of patients with sickle cell disease. Another possible treatment is hematopoietic cell transplantation. This is thought to be um, usually thought to be the only cure for sickle cell disease, and it's usually performed only in individuals less than 16 years old. And blood transfusion can be performed in patients with sickle cell disease because, especially in patients with severe anemia, if they have very low hemoglobin. And because of many of the symptoms I've mentioned before, due to vaso occlusion, um, pain management is very important in patients with sickle cell disease as well. Anyways, guys, uh, that was a lesson on sickle cell disease. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.